and Stephen held him under to the very last sin bubble came up. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm a little surprised by that. We lost electricity in the office and the student building, right? But y'all got it back on at some point? Yeah. Um, they really kind of messed things up over in those two buildings, but we're not having problems this morning until that happens. So. Uh, hopefully it's not a precursor of what's about to happen in, in the next few moments, but if so, uh, let's go ahead and grab your Bibles if you would, make your way to Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, while you're doing that I want to remind you, oh by the way if you don't have your own Bible there's uh, red Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you, and if you'll turn to page 730 you'll find Luke chapter 7 there. Um, tonight is our Easter community service uh, over at First Baptist at 6 p.m. So we really would like to invite you and encourage you to come. It's always a great time of, of fellowship and worship and exposition of God's Word as we gather together as, as uh, churches within the community. And it, it's good for us. It's encouraging to us as churches, but it's also good for the community to see uh, churches come together and worship uh, together. So I hope uh, if, if you don't have current plans or if you can get out of those current plans, either way, uh, you'll try uh, to come and be a part of that great service tonight. Uh, we begin a new series today entitled, He is Risen, and uh, Do You Know Who He Is? Uh, and through this sermon series, it's my desire to take from the seventh chapter of Luke and show to you what we learn about Jesus, but in the process of learning about Jesus, what we also learn about ourselves. Uh, because really, the best way to know Jesus is to come to a point of understanding your need for Jesus. And so there has to be a sense in which you know him, but also there has to be a sense in which we know ourselves as well. So hopefully you'll see that come out more so in the days ahead as we progress through this series. But our text this morning is found in the first 10 verses of chapter 7. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, and honor reading, reading God's word, if you'd stand. Scripture this morning tells us, when Jesus had finished saying all this, in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. But Jesus, excuse me, so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Father, this is your holy word given to us, Father, in print form this day, given to us for the purpose of knowing how we might worship you and live our lives for you. And now, Father, I would pray that you would help us to see through your word this morning more of who you are and even more of who we are or perhaps who we're not and should be. Now that, Father, we would not simply come and attend church today, but we would be the church, listening to you and responding to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. So we see from our text that there was a centurion. In fact, some of the translations use the word certain centurion. It's not a rabbi the text begins talking about, or it's not the servant of a rabbi, the servant of a Pharisee or a Sadducee or even a Jew, but a centurion, which is particularly interesting to us because a centurion of the Roman army was a high-ranking official who typically was responsible for around 100 men. 
he had the authority and, and uh, was discharged with taking care of those men and, and utilizing them. And Rome had taken over Capernaum and the surrounding area. The Roman army was notorious uh, for its use of force. Roman soldiers were particularly known to be brutal in their treatments of the Jews. But we're noticing something incredibly different about this particular centurion. Verse 2 says that he was deeply concerned for his servant, or the phrase that the NIV uses is highly, or excuse me, valued highly, which shows an extraordinary concern. Roman soldiers didn't generally value their slaves, much less value them highly. But this particular officer had an unusual concern for his servant. The Greek word translated valued highly means the servant was honored by the centurion. It is strikingly odd given the tensions between the two groups during those days. In other words, this centurion considered his slave to be much more than just property or a tool to be discarded once it becomes useless. He had a sense of care or love for this slave. No doubt, still a slave, but he cared for him. And we learn even more remarkable things about this centurion in verses 3 and 4. First of all, he sent Jewish elders to go find Jesus. Keep in mind, the centurion would be Gentile. Normally, the Gentiles would not associate with the Jews in the sense of cooperating and, and delivering messages. The Jews did, didn't like the Romans, and typically it would not be their messengers. But as you can imagine, when you have an occupying force living among you, you, you tend to kind of go along with some of their demands. I mean, you've got to live there somehow. And so there was some kind of general understandings, but this idea of choosing to send Jewish elders and the idea of Jewish elders delivering the message was beyond that type of cooperation. This was highly unusual, for typically they would consider themselves enemies, but here we see them operating together. And even more so, what we learn about the centurion in verse 4 is that the Jewish elders themselves go to Jesus and say to Jesus, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and built our synagogue. Now that's, we weren't expecting to see that in Scripture. Somehow, this particular, this certain centurion developed some type of respect for the God that the Jews were worshiping. He had some type of respect for their faith and the one whose their faith was representing. Although, and I'll mention this again later, there was no indication here that he was willing to accept the faith that these Jews had. We don't even know exactly what it means that he built our synagogue. Did he, did he just simply allow it to be built? Did he perhaps contribute financially to the building? Did he actually participate in the construction of the building? We, we don't understand, but this is what the Jewish elders were telling Jesus about this, this man. How unusual for Jewish elders... To go to Jesus and to say, Jesus, this Gentile deserves. <laughs> because they generally didn't believe the Gentiles deserved anything. But as you notice in verse 6, Jesus went. <laughs> as you see all throughout the Gospels, Jesus is one who is always leaning towards, turning towards, going to, ministering to, reaching out to the ones who are seeking him. 
irregardless of what others may think of the individual. Jesus simply cares. So my first question to ask you in this series is, do you know Jesus as the one who cares? Have you come to a point of understanding that Jesus cares not just for the entire world, which is true, but he cares specifically for you and for you and for you and for you. He cares for each and every one of us. And as you seek him, you'll find him to be one who will turn towards you, lean towards you, respond towards you, come to you as you need. As opposed to a God who is distant. As opposed to a God who says, well, good luck with that. He genuinely cares. But notice also in verse 6 something very striking. Jesus is on his way, but apparently the centurion had caught word that Jesus was on his way, or maybe he caught word that the Jewish elders had misrepresented him, speaking of him as being deserving, when he's thinking, no, and so he says to Jesus in verse 6, Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. Oh, there's so much in this. I ask you this morning, do you know Jesus as Lord? Do you know Jesus as Lord? The centurion called Jesus Lord. He himself was a man of authority, and he was calling out to Jesus, who was a Jew, and he's referring to him as Lord. That just didn't happen in those days. He didn't let his power, his position go to his head. He was willing to submit to authority. To, to get to know Jesus, you, you've got to be willing to submit yourself underneath his authority. You have to be willing to recognize his authority. Authority is very confusing these days. And what's going on in society, parents and children have this tension about authority, oftentimes in the home. I, I noticed this week, I happened to overhear a, a mom, as she kind of sternly spoke to her child and said, no, put that back. And I looked over towards their way, and there was this little boy looking eye to eye with his mother with a candy bar, a, candy, a piece of candy in his hand. And before anything could be said and or done, that child ripped open that wrapper and shoved that candy in his mouth. I mean, he basically said no. Some of y'all been there. I have. And some of you know, she, the mother looked at her child and said, no more. No more candy. Do you hear me? No more candy. And no sooner had she turned her back to get back to her shopping, he grabbed another piece of candy. And she heard that rapper and immediately turned around and realized what he was about to do, grabbed that thing and took it from him, to which he immediately began to cry hysterically, screaming out loud, gaining the attention of everybody else in the store. And she grabbed it, put it in the shopping cart, said, shh, let's talk about this later, and moved on. There's a tension there. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, the mother was fully in charge. <laughs> uh, it just may not seem like it, right? <laughs> there, there's that tension. And as we spoke about this uh, a couple weeks ago, about, about Jesus, and is he going to be Lord or are we going to say no to him? That tension exists in our relationship with Jesus as well. And I fear that there's too many times when I myself kind of rip open the wrapper and shove whatever I can in my mouth before he can say no again. Do you know him as Lord? 
The centurion acknowledged that he himself was a man of authority. He, he knew something about Jesus enough to call him Lord or someone of authority. The Bible speaks of others who refer to Jesus. They were not his disciples, but they still referred to him as Lord. In chapter 4, we saw weeks back that Jesus was confronted by a man with leprosy who approached him and cried out to him saying, Lord, please heal me. Again, we have no reason to believe that this centurion knew fully what calling Jesus Lord really meant. But at least by using this title, he was acknowledging something of which he believed about Jesus. Specifically, in the context of this verse, is that he believed Jesus had the power to heal. All Jesus had to do was say the word, and he believed that his servant would, in fact, be heard. So whatever it is he had heard in days past or seen of Jesus prior to this experience, it was enough for him to have such respect and faith in Jesus as to call him Lord. Do you know him as Lord? But notice also the centurion's humility. For he tells Jesus, I do not deserve. This message he sent back with his friends, I do not deserve. The Jewish elders told Jesus he was deserving. Why? Because he had shown concern for their nation and and built their synagogue. In other words, they felt he was deserving. Why? Because of what he did. But the centurion was feeling unworthy or undeserving because of who he is. He had a realistic understanding of himself. Back in the late 1600s, there was a clothing store owner who had a desire to be able to see the quality of thread better and unsatisfied with the present, the current day magnifying glasses. This man, I believe, I'm, I'll try to pronounce his name, Anthony Von Levenhock. Uh. Hook, Uh, it's not a hook, it's, yeah, Hook, Uh, began making his own lenses, experiment, and he began to to work the glass and and use them fire in such a way as to create different sizes and shapes and and thicknesses of of lenses, and he actually ended up designing his his own single lens microscope. Today, he's known as the father of microbiology because he was among the first or the first to to work with microbes which he referred to as animalcules, animalcules, okay, animalcules, animalcules. I'm from the mountains, you're from the sea, we say it differently. However it comes out, that's how you pronounce it, I'm sure. But what I wanted to say is to get to his quote, he, he took a closer look at water, Water that people looked in, they seen lakes and ponds, and they seen just a, a cup of water, and they, they assumed if you could see through the water, if it was transparent, if it looked clean, it was clean. But look what he discovered. These are words from his journal. He says, "I now saw very plainly that these were little eels or worms lying all huddled together and wriggling, just as if you saw with the naked eye." A whole tub full of very little eels in water, with the eels squirming among one another. And the whole water seemed to be alive with these multifarious animalcules. (laughs) Anybody want a glass of water right now? Now, now the word animalcules comes from the Greek word, which means tiny animals. There's a picture here of one. It's not from him. He didn't have photography to take a picture of it in those days. But tiny animals, today known as single-cell organisms, were discovered in the water. And so immediately, everybody's perspective on water changed. They, they didn't just look at water and consider it clean. They realized inside of what appeared to be clearing water was, was actually these tiny little creatures. You see, when... When you get to know Jesus, and the more you get to know Jesus, it kind of becomes like a microscope on our life. He just begins to expose layer after layer after layer or 
critter after critter after critter what's really inside of us. And this is good because we, we need to have an honest assessment of who we are. Our tendency is to think of ourselves too highly, to think as if we are deserving, when in reality we are not deserving. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah said long time ago, he said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond care. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. When, when we are willing to get honest about ourselves, when we're willing to admit our corrupt tendencies, our foul thoughts, our selfish sensualities, and even our meanness, we realize that hidden beneath the surface, unknown to the human eye, there are these things that, that bubble up from time to time. And we tend to believe they're only there when they bubble up, but the reality is they're always there just waiting, just percolating, just looking for that opportunity to, to, to be exposed. And when we come to understand that, then we join the centurion and say, I'm not worthy to have Jesus come to my house to be under my roof. If you remember back in chapter 6, Jesus pointed out that we have the tendency to point out the faults of others as if they're glaring out at us while we ignore our own faults. But here we're being reminded that it's time for us or a need for us to take a microscope and look within to see that we too have these animalcules within us. Just swimming around. As Christians, we have this tendency to look at violent, sadistic immorality seen in the lives of others and consider these people to be monsters. We, we don't even really consider them to be humans anymore. They, ha, they have crossed over some type of a, of a, of a line, and, and we, would, we would separate ourselves from them as if they are a whole other type of creation, and we are of a different type of creation. But the truth is, they are human just like we are. And we need to come to terms with that. While we may not commit the horrible acts that we see other people commit, we have to ask ourselves, are we ignoring our own involvement in sinful thoughts and behaviors that Scripture still calls to be sin? So Jesus helps us to see who we really are. And really, you can't fully know Jesus and His mission until you've understand who you really are, your need for him, and for what he offers to do for you. But I also want to ask you this morning, do you know Jesus has the power to heal? I mean, I, I know you're going to say, well, yes, I know he has the power to heal. Of course he does. He's done it many, many times, and we've experienced it ourselves. But do you know? I mean, do you have the faith that you see demonstrated in this passage by this particular, or as the scripture says, certain centurion. Because he said in verse 7, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. Just this past week, a few of us are sitting around talking about some stuff, and we realized God has shown up and done something phenomenal, and we, we was, it was amazing. Why are we amazed? When we know God does these things, do we know he does? I just, do you see, it's worth asking yourselves, do I have faith that God can and will heal? Knowing, of course, that we have to allow him to do it according to his will. What he wants to do, he may not choose to heal today. He may choose to heal tomorrow. He may not choose to heal until eternity, but he will heal. The point is, not when, but the point is he has the power. Do you know Jesus has the power to heal no need, he says. You don't need to come all the way to my house. This man is showing that he believed that Jesus had the power to heal just as much from a distance as he does in person. That's faith in the power of healing. 
This centurion was a Roman soldier, therefore he had the power of Rome behind him, but he wasn't turning to Rome. This man probably was wealthy because he was credited as helping to build or actually building the synagogue, but he's not turning to his money to help with his dying servant. He was well-liked or respected by the Jewish elders, but he's not turning to them when his servant is about to die. No, with his servant to the point of death, it was not the power of, excuse me, it was not power or possessions or even prestige that he turned to, but instead he turned to the power of Jesus Christ. Let's look at this man's faith for just a brief moment. This is Terry had a faith that, first of all, request. We talk about faith in Jesus. Do you have a faith that requests? He, he sought out Jesus. He asked of Jesus. He petitioned Jesus. Scripture says you have not because you've asked not. He, he was asking. But he also had the faith that realizes. He realized, meaning he has a complete or a better understanding, we should say, of himself. I don't believe he had a full understanding of himself because, I, again, I'll see no indication of him having, uh, making a decision of faith in Christ and repentance as we know it today. But he knew something about himself that he was not worthy. And by the way, I want to point out something. In the very beginning of this passage, verse 1, where it says, When Jesus had finished saying all this, Scripture is pointing back to the previous chapter, chapter 6, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And if you recall there, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks about the importance of understanding your spiritual condition. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Remember that? Jesus spoke about it, taught the importance of loving your enemies. Jesus spoke about the importance of being generous and, and merciful towards others. And on the heels of that great message, it seems as if within moments, here's a man on the scene who's being a living illustration of that. Because this man was recognizing he was unworthy. This man was loving his enemies. And he was generous and merciful towards others. But also we see that the centurion had a faith that was recognized. This, this to me is astounding. Look at verse 9. Scripture says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following, he said, I tell you, I have not found faith of such great faith even is Israel. Think about this. Briefly for a moment, how could Jesus have been amazed? He's God, and he knows all things from beginning to end. What could possibly amaze Jesus? Well, this is one of many examples of Jesus' humanity. And he met this man and saw this man's, excuse me, he didn't meet him, he just heard and knew about this man's faith from even from a distance, and he, he was amazed. Notice that Jesus didn't say, I have found such great, excuse me, I have not found such great kindness in all of Israel. Notice that he didn't say, I have not found such great generosity. Notice that he did not say, I have not found such great builder of synagogues. He says, I have not found eat such faith. He specifically, he, Jesus, is specifically pointing out this man's faith. It was not that the man treated the Jews well. It was not that he built a synagogue. It was his faith that Jesus noticed. And it's so much so that Jesus was amazed. To me, it's just astounding, this comment that Jesus makes about this man's faith. I only know of one other time in all of Scripture, all of the New Testament Gospels, in which Jesus is said to be amazed at something. And interestingly enough, I believe it's Mark 6, 6, and he's, we find there that's where the Jews rejected Jesus, and Scripture says that Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. If you know of another one, let me know afterwards. There's only two that I'm aware of. Both of them, interesting, are dealing with faith. One, he's amazed at their lack of faith. This one, he's amazed at his faith. Mm. Even though his 
faith is probably not a, sa- a saving faith or salvation faith, certainly not as we understand repentance and faith today. Jesus was still recognizing his faith and saying that he had not seen such even in all of Israel. And then lastly, look at verse 10. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Do you know Jesus is the one who has the power to heal? He has authority, authority over life. He can speak life into that which is dying. So we talk about, do you know who he is? Do, do you know that Jesus is the one who has the power to speak life into that of which is dying? Maybe this is simply a precursor to what we see that's going to happen in the future because Revelation tells us He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Do you, do you know who He is? Do you know who you are and what you are? Do you consider yourself to be worthy of God's grace? Do you inwardly think that because you attend church, you serve regularly, and you give your money that you are worthy of God's grace? Have you so internalized the good opinions that others have of you that despite the truth of what you know about yourself, you somehow still imagine and believe and picture that you're okay and you're going to make it to heaven? If so, then then you do not have an honest understanding of yourself. For the prophet Isaiah said, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. The reality is, is all of us are unworthy. There's nothing that we have done to earn God's grace and mercy. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing someone else can do or has done for us. The reality is we all begin being unworthy. Worthy, and must and we must see ourselves as this centurion saw himself undeserving of Jesus' presence. So we come to understand that apart from the grace and the mercy of God, we remain unworthy. And that's what Jesus was referred to in chapter six when he said, Blessed are the poor. In spirit. Read along as I read this passage to you about our Lord Jesus in Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now... He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. All of us begin unworthy, undeserving to have Jesus in our lives, but he came and he died on that cross for our sins. Even while we were still yet sinners, Scripture says, while we were enemies of God, He came for us and died. Why? Because He considered us valued and worthy because He created us. And when we choose to turn our life towards Him and unto Him, we become worthy of His presence, not because of anything that we have done, but because everything Jesus Christ has done for us. So as we head towards Easter and we prepare to celebrate for the celebration of his resurrection, 
I remind you that three days before that, there had to be a death. And so the book of Matthew records these words. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those standing there heard this. They said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks Split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Interesting. Two centurions knowing something about Jesus. Jesus died for you. And when you choose to place your faith in him, even though you're undeserving, he gives you your worth. And if you've never met Jesus, we would like to introduce you to him. For he is the Lord who cares. He is the Lord who has power to heal. He can speak life into those things that are dying. And he loves you. Let's pray. Father, Father, give us a glimpse of your holiness. Such that would cause us to recognize our unholiness. And therefore, our need for you. Father, no longer pretending we've got it all under control, no longer acting as if we have our life together, no longer fooling others around us. Help us to look within and to see ourselves for who we are. as we look inside, if, if we cannot see a Savior who has, who has changed us into a new creation, who has redeemed us, who, who has put us through the process of justification and, and working us through the process of sanctification, then, Father, may you give us the boldness and the courage this day to acknowledge that and to cry out as the centurion did, Lord. We may not even be able to begin with complete faith, but we can simply cry out to you as Lord and and ask you as one other did in Scripture, Lord, help me with my unbelief. If we turn towards you with hearts, willing to be honest with hearts that recognize our spiritual poverty and our need for you then you stand ready to do something incredible thank you God for being a God who loves gives who redeems you 
are worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, in just a few moments, we'll, we'll stand and we'll sing a song. And I encourage you to sing, but I also will encourage you that if, if maybe during this song, instead of singing, you just listen to the words read the words on the screen or maybe you just need to sit where you are and just spend a few moments praying with God or as always the altar's here we invite you to come and just kneel at this altar just spend a few moments with God and telling him what's on your heart be honest with him he can handle it I and other staff will be up here if you want to someone to pray with you or if God's doing something in your life and it's time for you to make a decision public if you're ready to choose to start a life with Christ we would love to know that today if you're ready to join this church we would love to talk with you about that opportunity as well but during this time don't merely just let the song go by instead allow the spirit to do something within your life this day would you stand at this time and as we sing this is your opportunity to respond